All right, hello, welcome to another stream, Saturday morning. <clears throat> All right, we're gonna continue work on the commercial game in two weeks challenge. It's Saturday, I started on Monday, so I'm almost a full week in, five days in or so. Um, so yeah, what's up, short stuff? Welcome, welcome. Glad to have you here. So I did some work already this morning, uh, mostly just doing some of the art. So making the tile map look a little bit nicer, which I think it's a little bit more presentable now. And then what I'm gonna do um, is continue work on some UI elements. So I drew up some UI elements here. So this is like a border for a hot bar. And then we've got some icons here. This is the Summon Skeleton Warrior, and this is Teleport. So I'm hoping to make that more apparent, maybe have a tooltip or something that has some skill info when you want to use it or when you hover over it. But um, yeah, we're going to get that implemented. We're going to see what we can do. And then uh, I still have to work on a lot of the, the actual gameplay here. So for those that aren't aware of what I'm building here. So I'm building off of my Ludum Dare 51 entry called Smack Demon, which was sort of like a really simple turn-based combat slash strategy game. And so what I'm doing is I'm building off of that foundation. I'm making a Necromancer game. So this is the Necromancer, which doesn't have art yet. And as the Necromancer, you summon skeletons. And it's turn-based, and so the idea is going to be you're going to have to defeat the enemies on the board by using your Necromancer abilities and or your Skeleton abilities. The trick, though, is that you only have one action per turn. So in a lot of turn-based games, you'll have, like, a number of actions or, like, action points that you can use. But this is going to be more like chess, where you can only move one piece at a time, where you can only use one ability at a time. And so I think making it like that is going to make to bring a lot of strategy into it um trying to gonna, gonna try to create situations where you can like use your skeletons to block skills for you so you can sacrifice their health to save yourself um you're gonna be able to swap places with your skeletons there's gonna be a tether radius so your skeletons are not going to be able to be more than a certain radius away from you otherwise they'll be unable to move um, and the Necromancer is going to have a very low amount of health and no direct damage abilities. So it's a little bit asymmetrical in the fact that your Necromancer is kind of like the lose condition, right? If you die as the Necromancer, then the, then the round is over. Um, but you can use all of your skeletons for offensive and defensive purposes. So that's kind of the general idea. And I'm hoping that by the end of... Let me show you what I have. By the end of Sunday, I'm hoping that I will have more or less the, the game loop 
in place and then I can spend a week just making content for it. So <clears throat> um, let's see. So yeah, uh, you missed the last two streams. Could you, uh, could you, I wanna colonize your country? Wow, that came out of nowhere. Well, good luck colonizing the United States. Um, probably not gonna be possible. There's more guns than people, but. <laughs> um. <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, I just went through that. Hello Z, welcome, welcome. Hello, uh, F-G-H-I-J Avery. Welcome, welcome. Think your brother pranked you? <laughs> hey, it's me, your brother. Good morning, welcome. Welcome. Good morning, Indy Ramos. Have you ever tried the Behave plugin for Godot? I have not. I've seen it, though. I tried, I made my own behavior tree implementation for a game that I did quite a while ago, and I wasn't... I wasn't very satisfied with um, how I did it. Now, maybe maybe my implementation was flawed, but it was really hard to keep track of the states and visualize the states. And the trees ended up becoming pretty large as soon as you needed something complex to happen. So there's a couple issues. Maybe, maybe behavior trees just weren't appropriate for my use case, but um, I don't know, I find that just writing the state machines tends to be a little bit more straightforward. Uh, let's see. He changed explain to colonize your country. Oh, wow. Oh, I see. <laughs> Hello, Zeto. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Avery, I've had a hard time with states and more fun with behavior trees yeah i mean it's just like you know it's a perfectly valid ai tool so use whatever you i think the important thing is use whatever you're you can make ai efficiently with right tried uh input handling and state machine but found it easier in bt okay who made the steam capsule art if you're willing to share for gunforged that was an artist called trampeton i don't have the link on me right now but if you go to that latest devlog video and look in the description you can uh, find the links to both of the the artists that i hired all right so i think what i'm going to be working on here is um i'm gonna i'm gonna replace this ui so right here this big button that says summon skeleton warrior that is just a placeholder for the ability that's in context. So you can see when I actually click a skeleton warrior, that goes away because the skeleton doesn't have any abilities that I can use. The only thing I can do with the skeleton is I can smack, smack the demon, right? But this, the uh, necromancer can summon a skeleton and put him anywhere within a two, two tile radius. <clears throat> so that's kind of what we got going on here. <coughs> You saw Gunforged on the featured and recommended on Steam yesterday. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, I, maybe I should have put together a, a good trailer for it. I figured I'd just get the Steam page up and then make a trailer later when I have more, um, <clears throat> you know, more footage to show. But if Steam's already recommending it, that's um, unfortunate that I don't have that in place. Are you sticking with Smack Demon for this release? Are you meaning like the title? The title will probably change. So the other thing I have implemented here is, <clears throat> excuse me, wow. The other thing I have implemented here is cooldowns. So the cooldowns are turn-based. So every time the player turn starts again, the cooldowns are reduced by one, one turn. And so I've got three turn cooldown here, but since there's no enemies, it just keeps uh, ticking down and now I can summon. Okay, so I think you all get the idea of the game. So let's do the fun part and make the UI. So here's one way, uh, what I'm gonna do here. So I've got this HBox container, which is the button container. I'm gonna wrap that in a panel container. And this panel container 
is going to go to the end and nope this needs to be shrink center shrink end there we go and we're going to override the theme here so new style box texture now i need to extract the texture out of here so hmm how do i want to do this I think what I want to do is let's rename this to hot bar. Well, I'm calling it ability bar. So ability bar panel. Let's create, let's call this icon summon warrior. And then we need to take this one, break that out into a new layer. And this is going to be icon teleport. Cool. And then I can use my fancy script export layers and I just export these and that will export every layer that I have actually it exported the reference too which I don't want so I'm going to get rid of this okay and now if I go to my UI folder you can see now that I've got all of those things so I've got my ability bar right here I've got my icon and my icons okay so, style box texture. This is going to be very simple. I'm just going to take that, drag it in there, enable pixel snap, and I want a two, two pixel buffer on each side. Two pixel padding, there we go. So that's basically that, and you can see that it's already showing up here. And now if I put the button container inside of that, and then do a texture rect, or do I want to do a texture button? I don't know what I want to use here. Maybe a texture button is more appropriate. Although that has a bunch of extra states that I don't want. So I'm just going to kind of make my own button texture rect. And let's see. Ah, maybe a texture button is going to be appropriate. I don't know. We'll figure it out. We'll do it live. So there you go. So that's how that's going to work. Just as a quick, you know, demonstration. And we're going to turn this, uh, let's see. The separation here, we're going to take do two. And so now we've got two pixel padding everywhere and we've got a nice little hot bar. And so if we go into the game, it should look pretty decent. There we go. So we've got your abilities down there. Maybe those icons need to be bigger, but we'll figure that out later. Uh, let's see. I assumed I already knew. Now, no, I'm not. I'm not like uh, I haven't checked the Steam stats at all for the game in like two weeks. So <laughs> I'm just trying not to like keep checking it because I I don't want to like set expectations and then look and be disappointed. You know, I'd rather be pleasantly surprised by just like checking it like once a month or something. Um, was it costly to create such a steam capsule? I mean, it depends on how much money you make, doesn't it? <laughs> um, it's not too costly. I mean, it's, um, it depends on the artist, but generally speaking, you can get that kind of art for between 100 and $300. So again, it depends on the artist. It depends on where the artist is located. It depends on the artist's experience, talent level, all that kind of stuff. But that's generally the range. Can you add some more enemies in Smack Demon? That's what I'm going to be doing in this game, yeah. More enemies. So, in fact, this demon might be going away. So basically, this is going to be like a spiritual successor to Smack Demon. I'm going to try to preserve... Uh, I'm going to try to preserve all of the elements of Smack Demon that made it fun, but just kind of like wrap it in a different sort of gameplay loop, you know? And we're going to see. I've got a week and a couple days left, so um, the game is in rough shape right now, to say the least. So let's create a new... Um, gee dang it. What should we do? All right, let's go texture button. Ability button. All right, scenes. We'll save that in UI. So our ability button... 
So we've got a normal texture. Let's just throw that in here. See, now the problem is that we're going to have these hover states and everything. And I think I'm either going to have to make multiple versions of the icons for all the states, or I can handle it in a generic way. What happens if I just run this? Like, is it going to... Okay, so nothing happens when I hover, hover over it. Okay, so that's fine. That's fine. Shrink that up. Okay, so I think... Let me try something here. So I want to do like a color rectangle. I want this to... I want this to like... Brighten it. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know about this. I might have to do individual sprites for all the different states because I don't know if this is going to be... All right, well, let's just start working on it and then we'll figure it out. So I'm going to call this the cooldown indicator. So this will be kind of like the grayed out version of this skill when it's on cooldown. And for the label, I want to see, let's see, floating text. What is this? Background label, label. All right. I thought I could borrow that, but I want to try a different strategy here. So let's say three. Oh my. So there's a way to set the theme in here. Theme. Custom theme, resources, theme, save and restart. So you can set your custom theme in the um, project settings and then restart the, the editor. And what that does now is that just makes every control node you have inherit from that theme. So you'll notice that I don't have any theme attached to this label here, but you can't really see it, <laughs> rip. But I've got my pixel three, right? So that's pretty nice. All right, so label, we need to make this center center. And of course you can't see it, so let's go ahead and go to my outline color. Uh huh. Font outline modulate. What is going on? Is there not a font outline color in here? Font color shadow. Shadow as outline. I don't know what's going on here. Oh, there we go. Okay, that works. Yeah, I think that's fine. Now, the color shouldn't be pure black because that's not part of my palette. So I'm just going to copy this off black color here, which actually looks like it's a little bit blue and a little bit green. Perfect. Now, why is that like not centered? Oh boy. Well, I'm going to use a different font anyway, so we'll just keep it like that. Let's see. Also, I see the title Gun Forge is a little bit different than the work on Trampeton. Yeah, the title was done by a different artist. I am not using Godot 4 for the two week project because there's still a ton of issues um, with it, and I don't want to like finish the game and then figure out oh wait, there's like a critical export issue that I can't, you know, release the game. So I'm using the stable version of Godot 3.5.1 because it's stable, right? Um, Godot 4 is just not reliable enough yet to be certain that it wouldn't give me any problems during the development. But I will be using Godot 4 for any projects that are going to be longer lived. Like, uh, like Gunforged. So there's our cooldown indicator. So we can just hide that by default, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Let's add a script. Scripts. Uh, yes. There we go. Game.ui. Okay. So first things first, we need to go to our ability bar. 
And in here, I want to add a resource preloader. You all know I love to use resource preloaders. Uh, let's see. Ability button, drag that on over. And then we can, just for entertainment purposes, put a couple of those ability buttons in there just so we can see what that looks like. All right. So the ability bar. So in here, on entity selected, we are showing all of the abilities. I'm going to rename this actually to on player entity selected. So in here, uh, what I'm doing is I'm just creating a new button, but instead what I want to do is grab a reference to that resource preloader. And I'm going to create the button by instancing that. So button equals resource preloader dot instance scene or null ability button. Okay. And ability buttons don't have text or anything, so that's fine. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a method in here. Now, here's the thing. Do I want to store a reference to the ability? Do I want to store a reference to the ability? Probably. Probably. Private default ability. Again, that's named, <laughs> that's named very wrong, but that's okay. Maybe we'll rename that. I'm just worried that that's gonna break everything if I rename this to something else. Uh, so we'll say this dot ability is equal to ability. And the other thing that I'm gonna do is in here, current cooldown, execute tile command. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a signal in here. Public, delegate, void, cooldown, started. Well, let's just do this, cooldown updated. Int number, or let's say, yeah, that's fine, number. Emit signal, name of, cooldown updated. Uh, to current cooldown. And we'll just omit it here too. Cooldown updated, current cooldown. So in that signal, or in that, in the ability button, we'll connect to that signal. So in here, ability.connect name of default ability dot cooldown updated this name of on cooldown updated so private void on cooldown updated what we're going to have is we need private control what is this this is the cooldown indicator right in the scene and so in here we've got our number so we've got our cooldown so a simple thing we're just going to do is we're going to say cooldown indicator dot visible is equal to cooldown greater than zero. And then let's create another, let's grab another reference to the cooldown text, I guess we'll call it. We'll say cooldown text is equal to cooldown. I guess I could have just used two string, but it's done. It's in stone, can't be edited. I have never used a resource preloader. Wait, let's see. So is this game being made because of burnout? No, not really. I just, I wanted to, so I got a bunch of comments about people wanting me to do more with Smack Demon. And I guess I did want a little bit of a change of pace, a little bit of a different project to work on. So I decided well, why not try to remake Smack Demon with some more content and depth, see if I can do it in a very limited amount of time so that I can get back to Gunforged as soon as possible. I have never used a resource preloader. What is the purpose of it? So to be honest, I don't really know. Um, I think it will, it will like recursively load any scenes and cache them and like resources and whatnot. But 
the what I use it for is essentially just a, a dictionary that contains references to um, scenes, right? And the way I like the reason I like doing this is because the alternate is to export like a packed scene from the root node, right? And then just drop in your packed scenes. But I just like this better because it's variable and you can put however many scenes you want in here. Like I could just be like, I want all of those, right? And I don't need to write an export variable for every single one. Um, so that's the main reason I use it. It's just kind of like a, a nice way to store references to your scenes and whatnot so that you can instance things. And then of course you get whatever added benefit comes along with loading up these resources that are within the scene pre-caching them. Do you use Godot visual scripting? I do not. No. No, I do not. Visual scripting is not something that I would probably ever use. Um, but if you're new to programming, then visual scripting might be a good way to start. Okay, so there's one thing that I need to do, which is I need to uh, cool down text. We'll mark this as unique node name. And then... Right, so we're gonna get rid of that. My ability button I need to set disabled. Button.disabled is equal to cooldown greater than zero. Uh, wait, just disabled. Cool. Ack, what's happening? So button text, we don't need this at all. So let's get rid of that. One thing that we do need to do is we need to, when this is ready, actually no. Let's create another method, private void update cooldown information. And then in here, update cooldown information, cooldown. We're gonna call update cooldown information in here with the ability dot get current cooldown. Okay, so that will make sure that it's up to date. And we can get rid of this. And yeah, so is that gonna work? Let's see. Let's see if that's gonna work. Oh, uh, it says, okay, that's not correct. Oh, I'm never setting the ability. Button dot set ability, ability. Okay, now it should work. And also what I should probably do is the ability bar needs to be hidden if there's no entity in context. So let's, um, let's grab a reference to that margin container, private margin container margin container okay and then in the ready method we're going to say margin container dot visible is equal to false and then on player entity selected equals true now where am i actually freeing the abilities oh okay Let's see, I'm gonna have to make a bunch of tweaks to this, but let's go ahead and see what's going on here. So I select this guy, boom, I've got this. I can click on the ability, and now it's got a cooldown of four, as you can see. Perfect, and then I can move this guy, it's three now. Awesome, so yeah, we're gonna want to do a bunch of animations for this UI and make it a little bit more sensible in terms of usability, but that is working at a very basic level now. So that's great. That is great. I also, uh, let's see, Zygen. I also have some issues with exporting packed scenes and trying to reference scenes sometimes that have previously been loaded already. I see, interesting. This is in Godot 4, so it could just be an issue there. Yeah, that's true, yeah. 
Yeah, beta 12, I think beta 12 was... Uh, beta 12 was pretty buggy for me, if I recall correctly. Best live stream to watch while taking a dump. Excellent. <laughs> That's a, a great honor. Um, Afrasiab. I hope I said that right. Hey, what's up? Welcome to the stream. Good to see you. Again, right? This is, uh, you've been at the stream a couple times now. Look at my skeleton army. Okay, well, the game is getting there. The game is getting there. So these buttons might be a little bit small, but we'll figure it out. Cool. All right, so I'm going to say that those are basically done at a, at a very basic level. So um, implement prettier ability bar. All right, let me just look at my notes here and see what, what needs to be done. I mean, obviously a lot, but what's the most important things to get done here? So let's, um, well, I have to do the player art, right? And I have to do some enemy art, but I've already done a bunch of art this morning. So I think we'll set that aside for now. I need to be able to acquire new abilities for the Necromancer. I need death animations. I need to be able to upgrade skeletons. So that's another part of this game. It'll be kind of like a roguelike. So you'll fight through a room of enemies. At the end, you'll get presented with a bunch of uh, options. You can either pick a new skill, you can upgrade an existing like summon skill like skeletons or whatever, um, and probably some other things. The, the When you upgrade your skeletons, they will get more powerful, but they'll also get a positive trait and a negative trait. So uh, there's a little bit of risk reward there. So your skeleton might gain extra health when you upgrade it, but um, it might gain a negative trait of doing damage to allies when it hits an enemy, like nearby allies, right? So the, the intent behind introducing the negative traits is to make the player have to think about how they're positioning the skeletons. Obviously, you're going to take a bunch of play testing, but... Um, so, let's see. Let's make another ability. Let's, let's, let's develop the teleport ability. So that way we can start working on the the full loop of like being able to acquire new abilities. So there's probably going to be a lot of refactoring involved in this, and we're going to see we're going to see how well I've set this whole system up. All right, let's see. Hello, Senshi. Welcome back. I love the idle shuffling of characters. Very nice touch. Thank you. Yeah, that was also in the original Smack Demon. It's very easy to give life to your game. The, the more I do game development, the more I'm realizing, like, just animate, like, everything, and your game just looks better. It can just be a really dead simple animation, too, but that adds a lot of life. Thanks for wishlisting, Zima. I really appreciate that. Anyone else that's interested, maybe I should. <laughs> I'm so bad at marketing. I'm so bad at it. Here. Here's the link to Gunforged if everyone wants to... Uh, go wishlist that if you haven't already. I would greatly appreciate that. Trayson, thank you so much. Yeah, I, I like to think that I, I know a little bit about game feel. But I'm glad that I'm glad that you guys are are seeing the the effect of the animation. Must say, for me to pick up a second game in parallel, I would be walking on thin ice. I forget everything from the first one. I understand that. And this is why, you know, I use very verbose um, method names and variable names. It just makes it easier to read the code when I, um, when I go back to code that I haven't worked on in a while. It's a lot easier to understand it, a lot easier to get back into. How do I plan to tackle the death animations? It'll probably just be a tween, so I have this animator component here, which is, has a bunch of tweens that each entity can share. And so I'll probably just do another one in here 
that's a death animation that all entities can have. So again, this is gonna be like chess. And so you think about a chess board, right? Like a physical chess board, each piece moves in the same way, right? You pick it up and you move it. There's not like a unique, you know, <laughs> animation in real life for like moving the queen, right? You just pick it up and move it. And so that's kind of like the feeling that I'm gonna go for. One, because it's easy and two, because I think that's gonna make it feel much more like a board game if everything's kind of like moving in the same way. But mostly it's just to keep uh, keep the amount of work down. <laughs> uh, which is this, C-sharp is better than GD script. Uh, it's better for me. I wouldn't say that it's better in an objective sense. It depends on what you enjoy. Yes, code should read like prose exactly from the book Clean Code, which I highly recommend. What's on my take on tween versus velocity process? Um, I don't know exactly what that question means, but process method, if you're talking about animating stuff in the process method, I guess I would only do that if a tween wouldn't be suitable for it, right? Because a tween is for tweening between two node known values. And so it wouldn't make sense, for instance, to use a tween to actually control a character, right? Like you wouldn't use a tween to do character movement. You would use like, you would write the code yourself and then utilize probably like a character body, right? Or a kinematic body as it's called in Godot 3. But if the tween is like, you need to animate between known points, or, or if you need to animate between known, known points, then I would use a tween. And by known, I just mean like something that's calculated, right? Um, hope that answers your question. Yes, I agree, Trayson. Uh, C Sharp. I think C Sharp will help you out more in software engineering generally, but if you're just interested in making games and you're, you don't want all of the benefits of C Sharp, then GD Script is totally acceptable. Verbose variable names are the number one thing I see lacking a lot from fresh college grads. Yes. Yeah, you don't need to. Yeah, <laughs> I, you've ever seen that code from like people who are actually mathematicians and it's like, yeah, it's like one letter variable names everywhere and you can't figure out what's what. It was like, I don't I don't remember there was there was like a some group did a model for something. I don't remember what it was. And they open sourced their code. And I was like, oh, I, I'm gonna go in and see, see what their code looks like for this model, right? And then I went in and like the code was just a jumbled mess. Like there's, there is no way that there weren't like 20 unknown bugs in that code. Like it was just terrible. So. Using tween to animate versus increasing velocity in the process. Okay, cool. Yeah. Mega Man X like projectiles that move in a pattern. Well, if the projectiles are moving, I guess it depends on how the projectiles are moving, but I'd probably do that in a process method and just use like steering behaviors or something to move them in the pattern that you want them to move in. All right. So let's go ahead and what are we doing? Right, let's implement a new ability. So I believe what I need to do is I need to create a new node. I'm gonna to try to do this without looking at anything else. Teleport ability, save scenes, ability, teleport ability. This is going to extend from default ability. Now I'm wondering if like, I, I might as well just rename this, right? So let's rename this right now. Rename. Oh, this is not going to actually be terribly bad. Oh, it's not going to be bad at all. So what are we going to call this? Base ability. That's fine. And then we're going to rename this in here. Base ability. Okay, well, maybe that was easier than I thought it was going to be. Okay, well, 
Let's just, uh, maybe we'll just do a quick check to make sure that that's working every, everywhere. Okay, well, seems to be working. Okay, get ability name. We're gonna return teleport. Get valid tiles. Okay, so this is gonna be the interesting one. So what I want to do is I want to, in my grid manager, So I have, I'm keeping track of all of the entity positions on the grid. And so what I probably want to do is I want to just, I want to be able to get all of them. Am I even using this? I don't know why that's there. So let's do this. Public dictionary. Do I want to return a dictionary? I guess so. Get. Return entity to tile position. If I was doing this correctly, I would construct a new dictionary out of the data inside of here because it's generally a bad idea to pass a private uh, member as a reference out of a public function. But I'm just going to trust myself not to modify that. Um, OK, so grid manager component get entity tile positions. OK, so var entity tile positions. So what am I doing in here? Well, firstly, what I want to do is my valid tiles are only going to be... Um, so the teleport is basically, it's not really a teleport, it's like a swap places. So it's like, I'll have to target a skeleton and then I'll be able to swap places with him. And so what I need to do is I'm going to use link, which is really useful for grid-based games, by the way. So entity two tile positions keys. So let's say var valid keys is equal to entity tile position dot keys dot where x x dot get first note of type uh, faction component faction is equal to faction type dot enemy and I'm gonna break this out onto a new line or the x is do I not have Necromancer? Let's see. Maybe I don't have a script on my player yet. I don't. Ooh. Let's go ahead and add a script. <laughs> Basically only for the purpose of being able to tell if a given entity is the Necromancer or not. So I just game object. Do I have dot entity? I don't. Okay. So X is Necromancer. Uh... Actually, this is supposed to be and, so, oh wow, I did this entirely wrong. So we wanna check where the faction type is belonging to the player and X is not Necromancer. So we're gonna get every ally entity. Oh, it doesn't want me to break that into a new, new, new line. Okay, well, I'm gonna get every ally entity that is not the Necromancer. And those are gonna be my valid keys. And then my valid tiles are going to be return entity tile positions dot select x. Actually, I want to do valid keys dot select entity tile positions x dot two array. So what this is essentially saying is, okay, these are all of the valid entities and then go back into that entity to tile positions array and grab um, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. Grab the position and then construct an array out of that. Okay. And actually I'm going to change this. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say public list node 2d get all entities instead. And what I'm essentially going to do is 
return entity to tile position dot keys dot to list. And then I'll get rid of this. So my valid entities, yep, okay. And then in here, I can say grid manager component dot get tile position of entity X. Okay, so that's a little bit safer. All right, let's see. Process the target, but use tween to make them dance a little. Yeah, so that that would work, right? So you have, you'd have, you imagine breaking down the particle, or sorry, the projectile motion, right? So presumably you want your projectile to trend generally in a direction. So what I would do is in the process method, just keep calculating the straight line. Like where would this projectile be if it was going in a straight line from the target position at a certain speed, right? So keep track of that. And then in the tween, what you can do is you can animate an offset along that path, right? So you're using that straight line path as your root position, essentially. And then you're just adding on to it some extra motion over time. Um, and that's probably the easiest way to get your projectile to go in the general direction you want it to go, while also maybe like, you know, oscillating back and forth. That's what I would probably do. <laughs> yeah, nested loops with so many X, Y, K, oh, X, Y, L, K, yeah, yeah. I like to name iterators decently well, yes. Renaming stuff in projects always scares you. Yes. Lowercase versus uppercase folder names. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Godot does not do a good job of notifying you that there's a case issue in your... Um, in your directory structure, which doesn't work. At least in, in Windows, I don't think. Tell you what, in the in the US, if you're looking to get a software engineering job, learn Node.js and React, and you will be set. <laughs> That's basically all I've been doing for the past several years is just JavaScript and TypeScript and all that good stuff. All right. So those are our valid tiles. And so we need to override this execute tile command, which is basically going to say, um, this is gonna be when we actually say, okay, we're actually executing this, this um, thing. So what we're gonna do, and this needs to be in the ability namespace. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, var current tile position is equal to um, entity, well, let's say grid manager dot get tile position of entity, entity. And these are variables that are already set in the base ability. So we're grabbing a reference to the grid manager and also a reference to the owner of the ability. So that's my current tile position. And obviously the command args has the target tile. So maybe we'll just pull that out. Okay, so now the tricky part is gonna be making them swap. And I think actually it probably will be very simple. Yeah, it's actually gonna be very simple. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say entity.globalPosition is equal to, and we'll want to animate this, right? So let's just put a to do animate this. We'll, we'll animate that later. Entity global position is equal to grid manager component dot world, uh, let's see, tile position to world tile center, uh, target tile. Cool. And then let's grab another variable called target entity is equal to grid manager component dot get tile position of entity at the target tile. And so we're gonna change the position of the target entity as well. Global position is equal to current tile position. So those are swapped. 
And then what we need to do Get tile position. Why is this wrong? Oh. Get entity at tile position. Whoops. Wrong one. Okay. So now in here, what we're going to do is, so we're swapping the global positions of both entities, and then I need to say grid manager component dot update entity tile position. And that's going to be my owner entity, the one that's casting the ability. And then the target position is going to be entity.global position. And then we're going to also update that for the target entity. And that should be pretty much it. I think that's basically it. So that's basically what goes into implementing an ability. Took a long time to set up the framework, but just overriding a couple of of things is all you need. So now the tricky thing is I'm going to need to probably specify some metadata about this, like the icons and whatnot. But let's see if it works. So I've got, got this. This is going to be the teleport. Okay, so you can see that this is my only valid tile. I can't click anywhere else. So if I do this, nothing happened. Heck yes. Oh, I know why. Oh, I know why. Already ran into a critical issue that destroyed my whole framework that I was just so proud about. Excellent work. All right, well. Hmm. Time to be stumped for a little bit. Uh, let's look at chat. We'll procrastinate. Backend web dev by day. Yeah, I love backend web development. I wish I did more of it, but I'm all, all on front end right now. You're doing infrastructure, Zaijin. Nice, nice. Game dev by night. Yes, welcome to the game dev by night hobby. That's the way to go. React dev is mostly king, yeah. Oh, Angular. I don't know if I've never seen an Angular project that's done well, or if Angular is just ugly by default, but I cannot stand that. You have a full stack React Node.js project I haven't touched since, uh, 2020. Uh, yeah, that sounds cool. Like, uh, yeah, a little eat, where to eat helper. That is cool. You know a little bit of Node.js, but have no idea where to start to actually get a job. So I can give you an idea. So on my last round of interviews, um, what I I had to do a bunch of coding challenges um, to get you know to pass the interview stages. And one of the coding challenges was make a Spotify or like make a front end app using whatever framework you want that can grab all of the songs and song information in a Spotify playlist. That was like the gist of it. So they wanted you to make a front end app that integrated with um, the Spotify API. And I guess it wasn't all front end. There was also a back end component for the API integration, but they wanted you to be able to fetch information from a playlist and then show that information on the front end in a list. So a very like, um, I guess contrived example like that, but if you if you do something like that, you're gonna have to learn how to do set up a server and run it locally. You're gonna have to learn how to integrate with a third party API, and then you're gonna learn how to or have to know, learn how to display that information. So get that information from the API through the server, pass it back to the front end, and then display it using React. So you kind of like tie in all of the skills together with just that simple that simple exercise. And so if you started with something like that, uh, you would actually learn a lot. And yeah, you wouldn't be able to like, I mean, it wouldn't be anything but a learning exercise, but it would, it would be great. .NET seems pretty popular. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't really encountered much .NET in my professional career. Yeah, game dev is, yeah, <laughs> avoid the problem. Game dev is fun. 
All right, Seema, thanks for hanging out. Uh, uh, look forward to seeing you in future streams. Hello, I still don't know how to pronounce your name, but welcome to the stream. Russian characters. Data bores me front end is so much fun. Yeah, data can be a little bit overwhelming. How badly are you cursed if you don't complete a to-do in Godot? Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's very easy for to-dos to com like just completely pile up and become overwhelming. So use them sparingly. Okay, so we have this problem here, which is basically being caused by the fact that I'm blocking any mouse input when an entity is being selected. And so we're going to have to figure out a way to fix that. Also, I have no way of canceling a current ability, so I... Well, I guess I can by doing this, but if I press escape, it doesn't do anything. Like, I can't go back to movement or something. So we're going to fix this issue in just a couple minutes, but first I'm going to take a quick break. While I'm gone, you guys can sign up for my newsletter at firebelly.com and wishlist Gunforge. That would be really helpful. So yeah, I'm going to take a quick one or two minute break, and then we'll be back to fix this issue. So enjoy the soothing tones of Lo-Fi Girl. All right, I'm back. All right, see ya, short stuff. Thanks for hanging out. All right. <clears throat> so what is, why is this blocking input for the mouse? So let's take a look at that. So uh, maybe I should, yeah, let me just commit this. Begin work on teleport ability. Oh, you know what I, else I need to override, which I didn't do? public override get cooldown get cooldown we're gonna give it a cooldown of maybe we're gonna give it a long cooldown because we don't want the player to teleport around all the time okay so we'll commit that so let's take a look at my player manager component so this is where all of the player input is handled and state related to that is handled. So we've got this on entity clicked. 
um, which is, so it's doing a couple things. If I have an entity selected, actually, let's see. Oh, maybe this actually isn't a problem. So look at this. I've got all these print statements here. I should execute this ability on the entity. I already thought about this. Maybe I'm not, uh, maybe I didn't, maybe I wasn't dumb. So anyway, so actually this is not the issue that I thought it was. See, the issue that I thought I was having is in here, what happens is like, so think about this. If you click on an entity that's on the board, what are all of the states that the game could be in when you click that entity, right? The first state is you have nothing in context, and so clicking on the entity should bring up the abilities, right? You should be able to see what abilities the entity has, see where you can move. If you click on an entity, you should be able to maybe see some information about that entity's abilities, right? So that's case number one when you click on an entity. Case number two is you already have an entity selected. So what happens when you click on an entity in that case? Well, what should happen in that case is either you need to be able to attack the entity if it's in range, or it should deselect the current entity and select the one you just clicked on, right? So you can already see that this logic is getting a little bit complicated, but then the third state is I click on an entity when I have an ability selected. So that's the case that we're in, right? I click on the teleport, which means I have an ability selected, and then I click on an entity. What needs to happen in that case is I need to handle it here. So I put a print statement here that handles that case. And so now I just gotta figure out how to do it properly. And I think all I need to do is call this handle ability tile command. Let's see if that works. Handle ability tile command. All right, let's do this. Var target tile is equal to, actually, let's just rename this to entity tile and then we'll replace this. Maybe that'll work. Let's see. <laughs> hey, Neozoid. Welcome, welcome. What about Gunforge? Gunforge development will continue. It might be a little bit delayed, though, because Godot 4 is about to release, and I'm going to try to release a Udemy course either before or right when Godot 4 officially hits stable. So Gunforge might be delayed for about a month here. I'm doing this two-week challenge. This will be done by a week from Monday, and then I'll probably have to start on the Udemy course right after that. So Gunforged is still something I want to do, but alas, I have limited time. And so I have to kind of like pick and choose what I work on. Yeah, exactly. Trayson's got it. Thank you, Trayson. All right. So let's see if I can teleport. Boom. Worked. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, but it looks like this broke. Oh, you know what? This is the problem that I thought I was going to have. So this update entity tile position, what this does is this clears the current data about the entity that's at the given target position and then reassigns it. So if I call this, no matter what order I call this in, it's actually going to override something, right? because I'm changing the global position of these things, then I'm saying, okay, update the entity tile position here and update the tile entity position here. And I think the issue is because, so the skeleton, let's say, the skeleton is now at the player's old position. And so what's going to happen is that, yeah, see it's removing well, is that what's happening? Gets a little bit confusing. I think that's what's happening, but maybe I'm wrong. So we're grabbing the tile position, right? Hmm. 
<laughs> I originally thought fireballs would try to complete Gun Gunforge within the next two weeks. <laughs> no, that game is uh, too too ambitious and too dear to my heart to try to rush it through. Why is this not working now? So let's rename this current entity tile position. Target entity tile position. So I'm changing the global position of the necromancer and the global position of the target entity. And then I'm updating both of those. I don't think that should be causing problems though. Because all I'm doing is I'm going, I'm saying, okay, let's clear the tile position of the necromancer. So if entity to tile position contains key necromancer, we're gonna we're gonna grab that current position and then remove both of those pieces of data from each dictionary. So I have one that's a key value of entity to tile position and another one that's a key value of tile position to entity. So I can look them up like both ways, right? But that should only be removing. Oh wait. Yeah, I think it's this problem. I think it's this here. Tile position to entity dot remove. So this is removing that tile position from the from the the dictionary. And so that means that yeah, so when I swap these positions what's happening is that that tile's being removed. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so there is one way around this, which I'm hesitant to do. Which is that I can check that the tile that I'm removing matches the entity that I'm removing, right? So I'm, I'm removing this entity. I could just do a quick check to see if, well, let's see. Oh, I did this wrong. I think I can probably, maybe this will be okay. So if I do tile position to tile position to entity dot remove uh, dot try get value position var out var entity at tile position. Right, and then I can, and so I can say here, if entity at tile position is not equal to, or equals entity. So basically I'm just validating that the tile that I'm removing from that dictionary does indeed contain currently the entity in question. So perhaps that will work. I don't really like introducing that very specific logic into something that should otherwise be simple, but you know what they say, YOLO. And it looks like it works now. Cool. While I'm thinking of it, I should probably do the same thing in these other ones. So in here, uh, let's do this again. So I'm just going to copy this. Tile position to effect, try get value position, out var effect at tile position. If effect at tile position is equal to effect, tile position to effect dot remove. Okay, so I'll just fix it there too while I'm at it. And that's basically the teleport ability. It's done. So I can swap. That's got a cooldown of, you know, whatever. Oh, and I need to summon another skeleton and then I can swap places with him. Awesome. We fixed it. 
What is the visual issue? I didn't catch it. Basically, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't select the entity. It was not accepting my input. All right, Chendrak, let's see. Can I do you a favor? We'll see if I can. I'm not fully understanding how you use resources. So, Chendrak, you want to create a system like Gunforged using resources. So, there's a there's sort of this idea in software engineering generally that you want to separate your data from your logic. And so, why do you want to do that? Because if you separate your data from your logic, that means that your logic by definition have to, has to be generic because it's relying on you supplying the data that it needs to work. And so that's where, that's kind of what I'm doing in Gunforged and that's where resources come in. So the resources are essentially just data containers. They contain numbers, strings, the kind of stuff that defines how a gun part behaves. And then I have a gun part scene and various other places throughout the app that rely on a generic representation of that data to act, right? So all gun resources extend from the same gun part resource. And anywhere in the game that needs to know, like let's say calculate the damage of a gun, can just say, well, I know that the gun is composed of three gun part resources. And so I'm gonna gather all those together and then calculate what the effect of all of those together is. So essentially the gun parts are just visual representations of, of the data. I don't know if that entirely makes sense, but just think in terms of like, you have your data and you have your behavior. The behavior should consume the data in a generic fashion. And that way you can make all kinds of different data through your resources, right? So for example, if you have a fire rate, I want to shoot five bullets per second in this one gun versus 10 bullets per second. Well, in your gun, you know that you are going to receive the data, how many bullets per second, but that data is going to be variable depending on which resource it's coming from. So the idea is that you calculate the delay between each shot by reading that piece of data from your resource um, when you go to fire the gun. Does that make any sense? Is this your hobby full-time job? This is my hobby for now. For now. I can make a deep dive video on gun forged architecture if people would think that's interesting. Um, are you creating new scenes for each gun? My issue is mainly how to instantiate them properly. Each gun part has its own scene. Yes. And the way that I'm instantiating them is I'm 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 actually using string manipulation. So I, I follow a naming pattern that's very specific. So if I if I have a MOS receiver resource, then it is programmatically looking for a MOS receiver gun part in a different directory when I need to instantiate it, right? So I'm actually, if you've ever done any like looking into Minecraft modding, which is kind of like where I really cemented this idea, Minecraft does a bunch of data loading based on the directory structure. So it's not like you're specifically hooking things up to other things. It's just like, oh, I have a resource that's named this thing. And so I know that because this resource is of type block that I should go to, you know, this blocks folder over here and then read you know, the image of the same name, right? And that's kind of what I'm doing. So I have a Moss receiver and a Moss gun part and a Moss muzzle flash, and I'll probably have like a, and I have a Moss bullet. I'm not directly linking any of those things together. I'm just making an assumption that if I have a Moss receiver gun part, then all of those other things exist as well. And I can just load them up programmatically in the code. Does that make sense? Would love a Gunforged architecture video. All right, maybe I'll have to do that then. Let me write that down real quick. Gunforged architecture video. 
All right. So we'll see if I have time to get around to that. Uh, there's so much to do. There's just not enough time in the day, you know? Okay, so that's working really well. So let's see. Get teleport working. So now that we have multiple abilities, let's actually work on... Um, Let's actually work on the game loop a little bit, right? So this is gonna be, this is gonna require a little bit of thinking. So right now I've just kind of set up this room in a very basic manner, but this is gonna kinda, uh, kinda be the, the standard room here. And so what I'm gonna do is, I'll probably just, I want to, hand create a bunch of different shapes of rooms that I can randomly pick from. And I'm going to need to determine how to spawn enemies and stuff. Oh, this is going to be... There's going to be a lot of work here, but... Alright, we'll do it live. Okay, so I think it's time... Am I even using this main menu anywhere? What scene is this? Let me just see. Oh, it just starts at level one. Does the level manager automatically load that? Maybe I can just transform my level manager. Well. Maybe I'll just overhaul this level manager. Yeah, let's do it. Where is start being called? Is there something that I'm missing here? Why when I run the game is it immediately starting at level one? Sorry, I gotta figure out what's going on here. I mean, maybe it's not even worth it. Maybe I'll just, yeah, I don't think it's worth it. I'm just gonna create my own well, everything's my own here, but my uh, a different way of, of handling this. So we're going to create a main. And this is going to kind of be responsible for the main gameplay loop. So sorry, level manager, I didn't mean to change you. We're going to get rid of that. OK, so let's do node. Um, in this case, I am going to use a, an array of packed scenes, so private packed scene rooms so I'll instantiate that to a new array let's create a ready method perfect new packed scene cool cool all right so i'm going to set this as my main scene so let's see. Here, we're going to change this to main. Perfect. Let's build. We're just going to take that room and just slap it in there. Cool. OK, on ready. So I'm going to create another method here. Private start room. Very basic. We're going to take rooms zero dot instance. And then we're going to say add child room. And then we're going to call start room. I forgot the void keyword. I'm going to call start room right here. Now, if all went well, I shouldn't really see a difference if I press play now. Okay. 
So we're right in the game, everything's the same. But now we can introduce some of the logic, right? So I can say private int current room equals zero. Maybe we'll say negative one and then current room increment that. So here's the thing. We are going to need to listen for when all of the enemies have died so we can handle the end state. So how are we going to do that? First, let me check chat. <clears throat> Overall, appreciate you doing all this development in the open. While I consider myself a seasoned dev, still very new to game dev and Godot. Yeah, I mean, I hope it helps. Yeah. It's fun also to have your collaboration when I'm thinking of ideas, get some brainstorming. So it's a mutually helpful exercise, I think, which is great. Linking based on path names always scares me. I might decide to rename the folders and then I have to change everything. That is a risk, yeah. That is a risk. Hello, Seabirdsan. Welcome back to the stream. It's going well. How are you doing? I'm glad you guys are enjoying the stream. The streams, plural. Just create level zero so it starts there, but it's actually the main menu. That's kind of what we're doing here. Stefan, by the way, welcome to the stream. Glad to have you all here. We're having a Saturday morning party. <laughs> Such a nerdy party. Uh, doing game dev. Anyway. So. We're going to connect to a signal in the room, which doesn't exist yet. Signal public delegate void finished okay so we're going to need to listen for we're gonna need to listen for when all of the enemies die and i'm just gonna stub something out here public void spawn enemies to do spawn enemies dynamically actually i may need to start writing this now because I need to be able to, well, for now, just listen for their deaths. So I'll just leave it to do. I'm just going to do something really basic here, which is I'm going to do this, or let's see, get tree dot get nodes in group faction component uh, dot where X X dot faction is equal to faction type dot enemy. And then we're going to select the X dot owner dot get first node of type. I love link so much. So basically we're getting all the faction components. We're going to get the faction components where they're enemy types. Then we're going to select the owner health component. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to filter that again. And so now we've got basically what I've done here with this link here. components is I'm grabbing all of the health components that belong to enemies because then what I can do is I can say let's do this private int current enemy count is equal to zero so current enemy count is equal to health components dot count and then for each var health component in in health components, we're going to say health component dot connect name of health component dot die. This name of on enemy died. Private void on enemy died. And then guess what we're going to do here? Current enemy count minus minus. If current enemy count is equal to zero, what are we going to do? We're going to emit that signal finished. 
And that's how I'm going to detect the end of the room. And so now in here, what I can say is connect to room dot finished. Where is that? Oh, do I need to? Where is my room? What's wrong here? Am I doing something wrong? Interesting. Room.connect name of room.finished. Am I doing something stupid here? This name of on room finished. I guess it's not importing. Oh, there's a room type in Godot. I see. So I need to do game.level.room. Gotcha. And I can just do, I guess, level.room. I see. It's just a name conflict with something that exists in Godot. I see. So on room finished, let's just print something for now. GD.print. Hey, fam. What's good? All right. So let's go ahead and run this. Let's check out the chat. Uh... I was watching the VOD of yesterday and I thought I was on the live one. Oh, <laughs> well, welcome to the stream light. Uh, glad to have you here again. Happens to the best of us, yeah. I'm in high school trying to learn programming. We were just starting to learn about strings after two years and all of this seems scary to work on. Um, scary isn't the word I would use. I would definitely say that it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming, but it's only overwhelming because you don't know what you don't know. As you get into it more and as things start to click, it's gonna become much less overwhelming. So it's difficult, but if you stick with it, you will understand it if you stick with it. You know, I didn't get to where I'm at overnight. I've been doing this for, I mean, if you wanna, I did start doing some programming at 14 and I'm 28 now. So I've been doing this for about 14 years. <laughs> so if it, if it looks easy, it's because I've been doing it for a very, very long time. It'd be looking, it'd be like uh, looking at a master carpenter and being like, how is he making tables and chairs so well? I can barely nail something together. Well, it's because he's been doing it for ever, right? So it does take a lot of time and you will understand it. See, Birdsan, it's good here. Uh, tried to upgrade to Godot 4 Beta 16. Seems like animation finished for animated sprite 2D is not firing anymore. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's that's the annoying part about using the betas is that some things will just break and you can't really do anything about it except wait for it to be fixed. Do you do you have auto save in Godot or do you manually save everything? I am manually saving everything. I just press Control S like a madman. <laughs> um, auto save might be nice, but I use a lot of like file formatters and stuff, and I just don't want it to like. I don't want my code to like jitter around on save because of an auto save, right? So I just prefer to manually save things. Hello, Lazar. Welcome back. Hello, Mohammed. Welcome, welcome. On a scale of one to 10, how's C sharp and Godot for someone with experience in Unity? Um, I think it's perfectly functional. I mean, I don't know what a 10 would look like, but um, it works really well. You can use NuGet packages. You can use Link. You can do everything that you are used to doing in C Sharp. Um, and it's probably actually better than Unity because it's more like how C Sharp is supposed to be. Um, meaning that you can... I don't know. My understanding is that Unity is using C Sharp as basically like a programming or like a scripting language, and so there's some weirdness to it, like coroutines and whatnot. But like in Godot C Sharp, you can use async await. You can use the asynchronous programming instead of coroutines. So I would say that it's if 10 means it works really well and you can do lots of standard C Sharp things in it, then it's a 10.
Did I get the motivation to start Smack Demon again from Green Rocks Games? No, actually, there's been a number of people that have left comments on my videos about wanting to see more Smack Demon. So that's kind of where I got the motivation to do a little bit of work on it. Yeah, if you have uh, other experience in other languages and... Um, well, if you have experience with other languages, then C Sharp is going to be very easy for you to adapt to, I think. Dragon Apple, do you do JavaScript as well? Yes, my day job is all front-end and back-end development in Node.js, React, that sort of thing. There's async and Unity. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking more of coroutines, though. Like, you can do something like a coroutine in Godot with just async await. Maybe, maybe that's changed in Unity as well. But... There's weird, like, Unity-specific ways of using C-sharp, at least to my understanding. Um, and there's a little bit of that in Godot, but not, not too much. Um, here's the other thing. Margincontainer.visible is equal to... I need to change this real quick. I don't want to show the abilities bar unless... unless the count is greater than zero. All right, so that's just a minor fix right there. What was I doing? I actually literally forgot what I was working on. Oh yeah, the main game loop. <laughs> okay. Right, I wanna kill an enemy and see if it prints like, hey fam, what's up? Or what's good or whatever it is. Okay, so that didn't work. That did not work, and why is that the case? Level room finished, so in here. Ah, because I'm not calling spawn enemies. I write like this big block of code without testing it, and it's always invariably the case that I just forgot one like minor detail that makes the whole thing not work. Boom. Ah, oh, it's still not working. Okay, I spoke too soon, I suppose. Let's print the current enemy count and see if it's even detecting this. Making good progress, though. If I keep up this rate of progress throughout the weekend, then I think this game is going to be basically mechanically finished by tomorrow night. Okay, so we've got a one got printed there. So that's good. Health component died on enemy died. Current enemy count emit signal name of finished. Oh wait, did I remove the print statement? Is that why it's not working? Oh no. Hmm, interesting. Let me just print in here. I wish I had my C sharp debugger working, but for some reason I'm missing some component that makes it not work. So print statements it is. Okay, so that it is working. Uh, is this pointing to the right? Hmm. So what is going on here? Oh, am I, am I pressing the wrong button? Is that what's happening? I think I was literally pressing the wrong button. Oh my goodness. I was pressing the wrong button. I didn't, instead of running the play button, I was running this, the scene locally. Okay, well. Oh, stupid errors. Okay, well. I have been seeing quite a number of web devs turning into game devs. Is that so? Yeah. I mean, I guess uh, it's kind of transferable, right? Because if, especially if you're doing front end development, you're kind of concerned with visuals and how things look and you might be doing animations and stuff. So I can see there being a little bit of overlap. I would imagine that front end devs tend to be more creative as well. That would be my guess. Or, or 
maybe not more creative, but more interested in being creative, right? I don't like having three versions of everything and half my stuff deprecated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Godot is like, I'm I'm impressed with with how well Godot as a project is managed despite being you know, FOSS software. It's really remarkable what they're doing in terms of project management and feature development and and the engine is still like super lightweight. It's just, yeah, it's quite an accomplishment. It really is. Saw the animation player in Godot and knew it was po probably time for me to switch. Yeah. Um, still learning Godot. Problem is almost all resources are about 2D and I'm more interested in developing 3D games. Yeah, that is a problem. Yeah. 3D is um, it's a whole different beast in Godot, but obviously I don't do any 3D development in Godot. Um, 2D for me, but yeah, Godot, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Godot is the best 2D engine on the market, period. Uh, whether you're looking at free engines or paid engines or whatever, it is the best, hands down. You can fight me on that. Well, I mean, <laughs> maybe not fight me. I don't think I'd win that fight, but you know, you know what I'm saying. Anyway. So what do we want to do when the room is finished? Well, we want to present some upgrades to the player. And now this is going to be the tricky part that's going to require some thinking. So what I need to do is I need to be able to supply the player with some abilities that he doesn't have yet or present the player with opportunities to upgrade the skeletons that he's got. And that might be a little bit tricky. That might be a little bit tricky. Well, let's design, let's maybe design a UI real quick for it. Um, I think I'm gonna do something really simple here. So I'm probably gonna take this UI panel. I'm gonna duplicate this. Bring this over. This UI panel here, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to just fill it in. Do I wanna do anything fancier? Like, do I wanna maybe give it Um, hmm. Give it a little border or something. That looks kind of cool, actually. Yeah, that looks kind of cool. I might, uh, I might stick with that. So there will be a panel, essentially, that will show you a bunch of your upgrade options, probably presented as little cards or something, kind of like in Gunforged. Oh goodness, that's going to be a little bit off, whatever. We'll just ignore that. So we're going to call this panel. And we're going to go ahead and export that with this handy export layers script here. Okay. So let's go ahead and create a new scene of type canvas layer. And we're going to call this the upgrade screen UI. I might just create a new folder here, call it screen. Upgrade screen. I always like to make my root nodes for my menus, or my, not my root nodes, but the nodes under which everything else will be. I always like to make them margin containers because get some nice padding off the edge of the screen, you know what I'm saying? So we're gonna add a panel. And what I might do is, I might bake that 
or, or configure this rather in the theme itself. So let's go to our panel container and let's override all. Uh, new stylebox texture. Got the panel here, so let's drag that on over. Snap mode pixel snap. Rip. Oh no. There we go. And then we'll just drag this over. I think that's good. Is that right? And then we want this to tile. So axis, stretch, tile, tile. All right, well, let's see if that works. So we're gonna have, go ahead and add a panel container. Does that look all right? I think that's fine. Yeah, I think that's fine. So for now, I'm just gonna add some buttons here. Upgrade. Those are just gonna be placeholder. And we wanna put those in an HBox container so they're side by side. Perfect. We'll shrink that to the center. Upgrade Skeletron. And then new ability. So they're not gonna look like this, but um, I'm just doing this for the purpose of getting something on paper, so to speak. And it will be iterated on relatively soon. Okay, so let's go ahead and throw that upgrade screen into the main here. So let's, where's my upgrade screen, upgrade screen. I'm just gonna go ahead and throw it onto the scene itself, just so I can see what that looks like as soon as I start the game. Alrighty, that's not looking too shabby. I mean, it is looking shabby, but not too shabby. Okay, so we're gonna want to show that upgrade screen now. I gotta create a new folder in my scripts here. UI create a new folder called screen. And so that way I can go ahead and add my script here. I wish there was a way to configure your default scripts directory too. I think I think the docs recommend keeping your scripts alongside your scenes, but no, I feel like in C sharp that just gets super messy. And also if you're using like VS code, having to like go through a bunch of different folders and like look through all the lists of scenes and everything to find your scripts is just, oh, it's not fun, you know? Okay, so let's grab a reference to that node private resource preloader. Resource preloader. And then when the room is finished, we're gonna say var upgrade screen is equal to resource preloader dot instance scene or null upgrade screen, add child upgrade screen. So now we have to figure out how to pass the desired upgrades over to that screen. So I think the, the easiest thing to do right now, well, let me think. I may need to Let me think about this. So the way that I'm, uh, so basically I need to be able to store a list of abilities and then be able to pull from those, like from a loot table or something, when I want to present the player with a reward for finishing the, the level. And um, I don't know how to do that with my current setup. Perhaps I could just do something really really hacky like use types so I could say 
you know, private loot table type ability loot table. Something like that. And then the way that I can use this is I can go ability loot table dot add item type of, you know, um, teleport ability with a weight of whatever, right? Perhaps I could do that. I might run into some issues there. Actually, let me try it. So, well, let me check out chat here. Uh, will you keep track of scores or achievement? Yeah, I'm going to have to implement some kind of save system, and maybe if I have time, I'll do Steam achievements as well. What about Construct 3 and Game Maker as 2D game engines in comparison to Godot? Yeah, I still think I think Godot is the best. I actually came from Game Maker. I was working in Game Maker Studio 2, and it is shocking how much more powerful Godot is than Game Maker Studio 2. I mean, it's like miles of difference between them. Um, like, even just basic stuff, like, I don't know, and I haven't used Game Maker Studio 2 in a while, but even basic stuff like having vector types, like, that didn't exist when I was using Game Maker Studio 2, right? Um, having to do all of your own collisions and not having, like, a proper physics system. It's just, like, it's amazing how much is lacking from Game Maker Studio 2, despite the fact that it's a premium program. And then Godot is over here being all free and whatnot and has like every single thing you could ever want for 2D development and getting more by the day. Admittedly, though, I haven't used Construct that much, but is that the one where you like visually set up your events and whatnot? I think that that I don't think that that's a very ergonomic way of developing games. I see a lot of game dev YouTubers that use like Construct or GDevelop or something. And it's like, I don't know how you keep track of what your quote unquote code is doing, because it's just like a paragraph of of words that are all nested. I think what I like about Godot is I can still apply traditional like software design patterns to it, which helps me keep track of like what's going on and like makes the system very I can design a, a framework very easily to facilitate the game that I'm developing. So, of course, all of that is my personal opinion. It's certainly not gospel truth. If you like GDevelop or you like Construct, then more power to you. Use the tools that you are efficient with. So, upgrade screen. So, hmm. So here's what I'm thinking. Upgrade definition or something. Oh, man, I don't know. I do not know. Public class. Skeleton. Up well, let's call it like a minion upgrade. Upgrade definition. Public class. Ability upgrade upgrade definition. So basically, here's what I'm thinking. We're going to take an upgrade, let's say upgrade definition. And let's just say like abstract. So I'm going to say, let's take an array of upgrade definitions. And then I can say for each var upgrade definition in upgrade definitions if upgrade definition is minion upgrade minion upgrade else if upgrade definition is ability upgrade so something like that is what i'm thinking and then maybe I can do something like this, public type, ability type. Uh, something like that, I don't know. I don't know if I'm liking how this is turning out, but you know what they say, YOLO. 
And then we're going to need something like this is just going to be a stub. So public int positive trait, public int negative trait. So just trying to stub out the data structure here. All right, let's see. Uh, let's just see if we can make this work. So button upgrade or button upgrade, <laughs> button container. We'll mark this as a unique name, node, private button container. Why am I calling it button container? Hbox container, cool. And so we're gonna create a button. So we're gonna say var button is equal to new button. And then at the end of this, we're gonna say button container dot add child button. So if it's an ability upgrade, where we're gonna say is like, let's just say button dot text is equal to, yeah, I don't even know if this is gonna work. This is a this is like a classic problem that I always have is that if I start storing a lot of data if I start storing a lot of data in like an ability here or like a, a node rather it becomes very hard to like extract that data out of that node and pass it around and so that's the problem that I'm running into here I basically need a way of Honestly, I probably should extract the ability data into like an ability definition class, right? So I should probably, you know, grab like, um, maybe not any of these, but like the ability name and the ability cooldown. I think I should probably do that. Split it out into a definition. Hmm. Because then I can pass the definition around, right? I think that's what I have to do. Hopefully it doesn't take too long. So the ability definition is essentially going to have like a public int cooldown, public, um, hmm. Yeah, we're gonna create an abstract. That's gonna be abstract, so public string Ability name. We'll probably want an ability description as well. Actually, don't need to do that. Description. Is that all I need, really? And then I need it to public packed scene. So I'm actually going to do this. Um, if you're still here, uh, Chendrak. I'm actually going to do what I was talking about earlier, which is loading things from the file system. So if I say public packed scene, get ability scene, right? What I can do is I can take I can take the name of this, right? So I can say var name is equal to type of this I think this is how I do it dot get name wait a minute why is that letting let me do that can I not do type of oh I guess I can't do that oh I would have to do uh, get type right get type dot get name yeah dot name and what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace
replace n. So we're going to replace the word definition with nothing. And so you'll see how this is working here. So if I want to load the packed scene, what do I do? I say return gd.load. Actually, yeah, that's fine. gd.load, watch this. Res scenes ability name dot tscn. And that's going to be loaded as a packed scene. So essentially, this is how it's going to work. So watch this. If I do... I'm going to create a new folder, actually. Called definition. Drag that in there. So watch this. So now I go here and I say new file. Fireball ability definition. Right? I say, well, let's just copy all this. Public class fireball ability definition extends ability definition. And I can do this, I believe. Public new. So I can just shadow all of these. And I can say my cooldown. I actually don't remember what that is, but... So now I've got this fireball ability definition. So what will happen is when I call the method get ability scene, it's going to get the type, which is this fireball ability definition, get the name of that, which again is fireball ability definition. It will replace the string definition at the end with an empty string. And then it will go to the file system and load this the, the scene with that name. And so now I've linked the definition to the scene without having to explicitly specify which scene it's it's linked to right do we have lambda function in godot c sharp yep you can use lambda functions and in godot 4 you can use lambda functions for signal connections as well which is really nice okay so here's what i'm gonna do base ability we're gonna get rid of get cooldown And we're going to get rid of public bool is default. Get rid of that. And I think that's pretty much it. Oh, get ability name. We don't want that. Cool. And so now what I'm going to do is in here, public ability definition. Now, the tricky thing here, too, is that if an entity starts with an ability definition, I need to link that, right? So So the problem is that if if this base ability exists in the scene tree, I need to be able to get the definition. Well, let me think about this. Yeah, so I basically need to set this up two way in two way fashion. So yeah, you'll see what I mean here. So basically what I need to do is I need to say gd.load she c sharp script. Wow. Res scripts ability definition and then this is going to be Type dot name definition. So what I'm essentially doing is I'm I'm basically loading that ability definition from the file system. Just like that. And then what I'm in my public here, I can say public 
definition. Oh, I already have it here. Ability definition. Get private set. Okay. Actually, maybe we'll just leave it like that. So now I can say my ability definition is equal to that. It looks scary, but it works really well. Okay, so let's see. What do I need to do now? Um, here, one second here. I think... Kind of losing my train of thought. Let's see, what are we doing? Close that for now. So I basically need to write... Right, so fireball ability... Ability name is fireball, so we'll get rid of that. So we basically just need to fix all the errors now. And perhaps I should change these. Okay, so we don't have any more data here, so let's create another one. So I'm just gonna copy this. So basically now we need to write definitions for all of these. So rename, melee ability definition. I'm gonna go to my melee ability. Is default is true there. Oh, bool. <laughs> Oops. All right. So this is melee. So melee. And that's basically it. And I do need to call base.notification here in all of these. Thankfully, we don't have too many of these to do. Okay, I'm just going to close all of these for now. Get more focused here. All right. So, move ability. So, we need to create a new move ability definition. Move ability definition. Move, what is my cooldown? Nothing, and it's default as well. So, let's go ahead and just. Yep, that's it. Okay, so another one. Summon Skeleton Warrior. Oh my goodness. Warrior ability. So this one's actually named wrong, so I'm gonna have to do that. Summon Skeleton Warrior ability definition. It's probably too long. Is default is not valid. And... It's a five cooldown, five turn cooldown. Okay, perfect. And then we have just the teleport ability. So new C sharp class teleport. Well, yeah. Teleport ability definition. And that cooldown was eight, I believe. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Okay. So now in here, we're going to say ability definition dot cooldown. So we're just going to read that data from the cooldown now. And I believe that's it. Uh, there's going to be more errors in here. So maybe I should just build and see what happens. 
Hello, Ryza FN. Welcome to the stream. Okay, so it looks like it's mostly in place now. I'm just going to make sure that... Yeah, I need to go base.notification. I need to make sure to call base notification. Every place where I have an ability. All right. All right, then. So that's um, that's all good. So the last thing I need to do is I need to rename my skeleton warrior. Rename this to summon skeleton warrior ability. Otherwise, the string matching won't work. All right. Uh, any bets on if this is going to work or not? Well, if you bet no, then you were correct. Oh, because I'm doing something something dumb here. Okay, let's try again. Still three errors. Scripts, ability, definition, move ability. Definition, resource file not found. Did I spell something wrong? Scripts, ability. Let me see. Scripts, ability. So it doesn't, it can't find it for some reason. Am I doing something wrong? Oh. Yes, I am. I'm going to put .cs at the end. Oh, more errors now. Cannot open file. Why can't I open the file? Do I need to make this extend reference? Nope. Hmm, we're gonna have to figure that out. Do you know the difference between definition and definition? Uh, definition is not a word. That is the difference. Unless, I mean, it could be a word. It's not a word that I've heard before. Um, hmm. Why is this not working? Let me think for a second here. Yeah, it's very odd. Uh, hmm. Is that a real word, really? <laughs> I don't think that's a real word. I think you're... You're pulling my leg. What games do I play? Well, I'll be playing uh, Elden Ring when the DLC comes out for sure. But at the moment, I'm not really playing much of anything. I was playing um, Against the Storm a little bit a couple weeks ago. And I play Tiny Rogues on occasion. I love that game. Am I doing something wrong here? Scripts, ability, definition. Started playing some Minecraft again. Oh yeah, that's a that's a classic. Do you play modded? Ah, I don't know why this isn't working.
What happens if I do this? If that doesn't work, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be in trouble here. Cannot instance script because class summon skeleton warrior ability could not be found. Oh, I need to update the class in here. Okay. Lots of uh, lots of little little issues. Okay, so that is working except it crashes. So now I gotta figure out why it's not working in here. Get type dot name definition. GD dot print get type dot name move ability is there just something wrong with my move ability here oh is my little trick not going to work here read f all file utf8 cannot Cannot open file. Why can't I open the file? Let's do this. Might have to come up with a different strategy for this, which would be unfortunate, but I guess wouldn't be too bad. I wanted to make it work in a fancy manner, but if it's not going to work in a fancy manner... Then I guess I can't do that. It doesn't like to load it for some reason. Can I just, I wonder if I just load instead of trying to cast it and everything. Yeah, it doesn't, it can't, am I doing something dumb? Is this like move ability definition? Did I spell something wrong? Move ability definition. Oh. I literally never made a move ability definition. That would explain it. Oh, I have two. Oh, I forgot to rename this. Oops. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> okay, it should work. Let's see. Hello, T-Boy. Welcome, welcome. And crash. Why is that crashing? Ability definition is not is not defined. Print. So I'm just gonna print that. So oh it's okay. X dot name. Also there's another GD print lurking around somewhere. There we go. Get rid of that. Oh, because I got to uncomment that. Okay, great. Cool. After trudging through all of my self-inflicted errors, it still doesn't work. Oh, right. Move ability. What doesn't it like here? So let's print x dot ability definition and see if that works. Null. Okay, so it's still null. 
is, uh, am I not configuring the move ability correctly? Let's print the ability definition here and see if it's ever null when it's being instantiated. It's always null when being instantiated. Excellent. Can it not be abstract? Let's see. Might be a weird Godot rule happening here. I've, I did this in Godot 4, so it's possible that it's just not, not working. What happens if I just, um... What happens if I just print gd.print cs file? Maybe I need to do... Do I need to do something fancy here? Do I need to do... I think... Yeah, there's some, like, weird boxing or unboxing that needs to happen here. Let me see. Null, null, null. What happens if I print csfile.new? Maybe I can't do this, I don't know. Is making games complicated? It can be. It can definitely be complicated. It doesn't like the new, hmm. Can be complicated for sure, but easy games are not terribly complicated. So it's loading the script. Uh, let me try something. Resource loader load C sharp script. That's how I'm doing it. It doesn't work. Load C sharp script at this path. It gets a reference to the CS file, but when I want to, when I call new on it, it becomes null. That's bizarre. I don't know what's going on. So I go to Stack Overflow or Docs. Yeah, I mean, I'm doing it right. It's just null. For some reason, there's no other way to instantiate this. Can I duplicate it? Dot new. Is that going to work? We're just going to try a bunch of weird stuff until it works. I mean, if I get stuck on this for much longer, I'm just going to manually set it. Okay, well. Well, um, the thing that I can do then, I guess, is... If this is not gonna work, then I might just have to override a function for returning it. I wonder what happens if I do it in like the ready method instead. Yeah, nothing happens. I don't, I didn't think anything would happen. My guess is that there's something about this ability definition. Maybe I need to make it extend reference or something. I literally don't know why this isn't working. 
it it gets a reference to the file, so it exists, and as soon as I call new, it's null. Object. We'll just try a bunch of weird casting. It's not going to work. If it's not going to work, then... Then I'm just going to... Uh, do something else. Okay, well, it's not working. So, we're going to get rid of that. We're going to get rid of this. We're going to create an abstract... Public... Abstract... Ability definition... Get ability definition. And now i got to go through all of my abilities and implement that which is not a big deal but return new fireball ability definition the only problem with this approach is that if i want if i want to modify a specific instance of the ability it might yeah it might uh, be a little bit iffy but oh well we will deal with that later Maybe reload the project. I don't think that would help. Unfortunately. What is the most complicated part of making games in the whole process? The most complicated part. Uh, let me think about that. Let me think about that. Um... Most complicated part. Honestly, I think the most complicated part is making your game fun. It's very easy to put together a game that technically works, but then isn't fun, that people don't want to play, right? So that's, that's probably the most complicated part because it's fun is subjective. It's kind of like subjective and scientific like there are there are ways to for sure make your game more fun but if you want to make your game fun to the point where people will buy it and play it um, that is a very tough thing to do so i think that's my uh that's my opinion on that on that Okay, let's see if this works now. Why do I have three abilities down here? Oh. My move ability is supposed to be true. Something's wrong. Oh, so it looks like... It looks like the shadowing isn't working. Is that what's going on? Did I do the shadowing wrong? Get default abilities. This is just going to be endless problems, isn't it? So, I think what's happening is that... Yeah, this is not working. This is default, is not being shadowed. Print axe.get ability definition dot get type. What is this type? Is it I guess it's referencing the base type instead of the No, 
no, it's it's returning all of those types. Why is the anyone know why the shadowing isn't working here? So if I've got so these are returning like move ability and melee ability, or I guess just the move ability needs to not show up. And the move ability. Oh wait. So it has is default equals true here, which apparently is not being referenced. It's like true is not not being used. Hello, uh, Jaeger Atritas. Atritas. Um, let's see. Um, is this for a game jam? No, this is just a personal challenge, two week challenge. Uh, just doing it for fun. I thought coding or, uh, or maybe in my opinion, well, coding is, is pretty straightforward once you are experienced with it. So it's not the hard, it's not hard to get something to work in a game. Yeah. Designing the frameworks is challenging too. I'm not, yeah, well, coding is simple once you have the experience. If your question is what's going to be the most complicated thing to do for a new game dev, then probably coding, yeah. But assuming that you have the skills required to actually make a game, the most complicated part is not, you know, coding or drawing or doing the art or laying out the UI. The most challenging part is like, how do you create a game that actually people want to play? Otherwise, you're just developing a piece of software, right? So this is just not working. Why does everything want to uh, want to not work today? I'm eating up a bunch of time on this. Get ability definition is default. Why is it not referencing? Whoops. This is as move ability definition. I'm just going to try casting it and see what that does. I really have no clue what's going on here. I have no clue why this is not working. Wow, that's frustrating. I click that, I get three abilities that show up, one of which is the move ability. And for some reason that's being called many times. So the shadowing is not working, it looks like. Well, who knows what's going on? I just can't motivate myself to code nowadays. I have one room to design, putting it off for more than two weeks. Yeah, it's a struggle. It's definitely not easy, but the only way out is through. I don't understand why this isn't working. I'm just going to override the two string here is default equals I'm probably I, maybe shadowing doesn't work I don't know why
Hmm. Let's print two string and see what's happening here. Is default equals true? I guess the shadowing just doesn't work. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> Is default equals true? False. So it's reading the value of the base type is default rather than the shadowed version here for some reason. Do I need to also do get private set in here? Oops, I put that in the wrong spot. Is it because it's not a field? Is that what's going on? No, look at that. So it prints the overridden to string, but it doesn't use the the shadowed value. So that's um, yeah. Well, that's annoying. Why is that the case? What what? Why does C sharp work like that? Is it because the, I'm making these properties instead of fields? If I remove those, is it going to work? No, it still doesn't work. Well, I suppose what I can do instead is... Instead of shadowing, I guess I'll just... Override the constructor. I guess I'll just override the constructor. That's not what I wanted to do, because it's slightly more annoying, but that's what's going to have to happen. Its set accessor is an Oh, is this why? Did I make it private instead of protected? Oh, if that was it, I'm going to be very upset. Let's see. No. So it wasn't because it was private, but... Oh, well, we'll just do constructors. Wait a minute. Maybe I should, uh, maybe I should just make sure this works before I go all in on the constructor. It should. This should work, I think. What in the heck is going on? Okay, there's obviously something very wrong here. I can't even... This doesn't make any sense. I am completely stumped on this. This is this is being very weird. Get ability definition. So I'm using get ability definition here. Move ability. Move ability definition. I'm overriding the constructor. Oh, I'm still shadowing these. That's why. Yeah, I didn't remove this. Whoops. Okay. All right. The adventure's almost over. Please, please be almost over. Oh, okay. There we go. It's finally working. Jeepers. All right. I guess you can't shadow. You can't. I can't shadow in base classes. That doesn't seem right to me. But. Maybe it's some wonkiness about how C-sharp works. In any case... In any case... So don't try to shadow... Um, don't try to shadow fields. <laughs> in... Uh, classes in in a uh, 
What what's the word? Descendant classes. Do not try it. Public summon skeleton warrior ability definition. Okay, one more. Public teleport ability definition. All right, everything should be good now. Get rid of that. All right, let's run it. Okay, everything's working. Jeez, that was um kind of an adventure there. I'm surprised I didn't get any errors or warnings about that from my IDE if that wasn't going to work. Very interesting. Might be the new thing that's hiding it. Maybe. I can make the properties virtual. I didn't know properties could be virtual. That's interesting. I could always delete the whole project, yeah. New hides it. I see. That doesn't make any sense to me, though. I don't know why that would happen. Because it's creating a new instance and it's not related. Or it's creating a new field. Not related to the base field. I guess it makes sense in that, in that aspect. That's very weird. Is Godot better than Unity? For... 2D development, yes. Um, 3D development, I don't know. I don't. I'm not really familiar with the Godot 3D workflow, so I can't really answer that question. Okay, everything appears to be working. So back to hello, Shadow. All right, so back to my main. So now what I can do in here, my loot table, is I can say ability definition, ability loot table, right? And then what I can do is I can say ability loot table dot add new teleport ability definition. So now that that's part of the loot table. And then when I go to my upgrade screen in here, what I can say is my ability definition Ability definition. And then what I was trying to do is I can set my button text to my ability upgrade dot ability definition dot name, right? And let's just get this working real quick. So upgrade definitions. So I'm going to say ability loot table dot pick item for ability. Then we're going to say upgrade screen dot set uh, set upgrades new upgrade definition. Oops, <laughs> uh, ability just like that. I think. Oh. new ability upgrade yeah ability upgrade okay ability definition equals ability this actually needs to be capitalized cool so that's kind of what i'm going for here So I can set my upgrades now in here when the room is finished by picking them from a loot table. Go into set upgrades. It's going to detect that. Button dot connect pressed. This name of on ability button pressed. Private void on ability button pressed. Oops. We're going to send in a uh, probably reference here. So let's extend reference from our upgrade definition. 
ability upgrade, ability upgrade. New Godot.collections.array. So we're sending that in. And now we need to figure out a way to add this to our player, which actually probably shouldn't be added to the player. It should probably be added to some sort of like global manager here. So let's create, yeah, so it should probably be kept track of in the main because we're recreating the player every time we load a scene. And so that means we need to recreate and insert all of the new abilities that the player has as well. So public delegate void ability upgraded. Uh, let's do ability upgrade chosen. Name of ability upgrade chosen. Cool, and then in our main, we can connect to that. So we can say upgrade screen dot connect name of upgrade screen dot ability upgrade chosen this name of on ability And for now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add it directly to the to the necromancer. So I'm just going to say this is not how the game is going to be, but this dot let's go to my node extensions. Very cheap way. Get necromancer. I just have a bunch of extension methods for grabbing the, the nodes that I commonly need, <laughs> which is kind of like fun. Get first node of type abilities component dot add child. Watch this ability upgrade ability upgrade dot ability definition dot get ability scene dot instance. And if all worked out, I should be able to choose teleport now after defeating. Oh, I also need to do this upgrade. Ah, oh, gee, dang it. I think I need to pass in the upgrade screen here. then I could call upgrade screen dot Q free. All right, let's go to our necromancer, delete the teleport ability from there and see if I can beat the demon to gain that ability. Oh, I put that in the wrong spot. Oops. All right, let's see what happens. So look, I only have one ability here and that's summon skeleton. If I kill this guy, it did not work. Did I click the wrong button again? I did. <laughs> I clicked the wrong button again. All right, here we go. Okay, so I can click teleport, boom, and it crashed. All good. So something's wrong with my string, my file system again. Let's see. <laughs> why is my name? Why is my name HBox container? Huh? All right, let's see. Why 
Why is the name HBox container? That's ridiculous. Um, perhaps it's... Uh, what is going on? What is going on? So git ability scene for some reason thinks that get type dot name is hbox container. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is going on? Let's see. I just got here, what's been going on? Just a bunch of issues. What's this game about? It's a turn-based necromancer game. Cool. Um, yeah, testing, you can just, uh, you can look at all across YouTube, there's a bunch of good stuff. I also have a Udemy course that you can try but that Udemy course is not... The Udemy course is not um, for beginner programmers. So if you're not familiar with programming, I would recommend not doing my Udemy course. But um, if you are familiar with programming or you want to be brave, you can definitely give it a shot. All right, this is just absolutely whack. It thinks that Let's see. For some reason, it thinks that it's extending from... This is just so... All kinds of broken. Null. The name is Null. Let me just make sure that it's being, let's see, print ability here. I just gotta make sure that it's it's picking from the loot table properly and all that good stuff. I keep pressing the wrong button. Go, go, go. Teleport ability definition, okay, that's correct. Then it gets put into this new ability upgrade, which extends upgrade definition and then reference. That gets passed into an upgrade definitions here. Gets passed in there on ability GD print ability upgrade dot ability definition dot name. Let's just do that. We'll just follow the logic. Null. Oh no, teleport there. Okay, and then it's sending the ability upgrade back. Oh, um, oh, I think I, okay, okay, okay. I, got, I know what I did wrong. I did my binds wrong here. The ability upgrade comes first, and then the upgrade screen. I just had them in the reverse order. Wow, I was about to go insane, but I didn't. I'm still here. Okay. Now, let's see. Okay, so the Necromancer has just a summon skeleton ability. I can hit this, boom, grab teleport, and now I have a teleport ability. And it crashed. Wow. 
Why did it crash? <laughs> oh, just fun times. Making grid-based turn-based games is like the most, the hardest type of game to make, in my opinion. Maybe outside of MMOs. There's just so much like asynchronous state that you have to worry about. So it crashes like that, but if I... If I add the teleport ability to the Necromancer beforehand and use it, it works. That's weird. That's really weird. I'm going to use the teleport. I'm just going to use the other teleport now. It could be related to... Oh, well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> Let me check the, the scene tree. Let's see what happens when I... Okay, so I've got that ability. Let's look at the remote scene tree. I've got my teleport ability here. That's so was bizarre. But it doesn't work for some reason after I add it. That's so weird. So it has something to do with the fact... Oh. Oh, it doesn't have an owner. That's the problem. That's the problem. And so I'm going to do something a little bit uh, actually trickier. Owner as node 2D or get parent dot owner. Okay, that's not the prettiest piece of code, but that should fix it. So it's because when I add something to the scene tree and runtime, they don't have owners. Okay. So yeah, the, the alternate is just like, well, get the ability component parent and then grab that as the owner. That's fine. Um, actually, I might just make that d the default because all abilities have to be children of the abilities component. Wow. Yeah, so if you're familiar with uh, Python and JS, then you might enjoy my Udemy course. So the, there's a link in the description for that. So I would recommend giving it a shot. It's pretty cheap. You can probably get it for 15 bucks. Cool. Cool. All right, well, that's a three-hour stream for you all. That was a lot of fun. Uh, got through some nice work, but I'm going to call it there and go eat some lunch. It's 1 p.m. now. So start work on main upgrade flow. So yeah, that was a lot of fun. Thank you all for watching. Thank you all for tuning in and hanging out. I'm going to go eat and probably, well, I'll need to continue work on this later, but don't know if I'll stream, but subscribe and ring that notification bell if you want to be notified if I do go live again today or tomorrow. And uh, yeah, hope you all have a good afternoon and I will see you next time. All right. Goodbye, everyone.